He that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. Now nothing could be clearer in the word of God than that nobody keeps God's commandment perfectly or meritoriously. That's a word we use some. Meritoriously means simply that uh, to, to earn favor, to to uh, meet a requirement of righteousness, meritorious. Nobody keeps God's commandments in a meritorious way. It doesn't earn any favor with God when you do something that's relatively good in this world, such as worshiping him this morning. That's relatively better than not worshiping him this morning. But it's not meritorious because we're sinners yet in our hearts. We still have a heart of flesh that's full of sin and our motives are messed up. Our, our, our will is depraved. Our, the intensity, if you could even use that word, of our worship is weak. And so we fall way far short of anything that would come close to being acceptable in the sight of God, even in, even as believers. And again, that's very clear in the scriptures. Now, if, if sinners could keep God's commandment perfectly or in a meritorious way, then salvation would have been by the law. That's what the scripture says. Listen to Galatians 2.21. Paul wrote to the church at Galatia, I do not frustrate the grace of God. And that word frustrate means to do away with or reject. I do not reject the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. If a, if a sinner can be righteous before God by keeping the law, then that's how sinners would be saved. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't just come to die for it so that people would feel sorry for him, like religion seems to think. He came to be his people's righteousness and sin offering. All of our righteousness. Everything he did is meritorious before God. But it's to, to, to say that any righteousness, even a supplemental righteousness, would come by the law would be to frustrate or do away with or reject the grace of God. And that puts you in a really bad place. And me. And Christ is dead in vain. What a horrible thought. Perish the thought. God forbid. Galatians 3.21. I should have you turn there. Let's turn together. If we go a little bit long this morning, then I'll make up for it later. <laughs> Galatians 3.21. This is the next chapter from where we just quoted in Galatians 2. Galatians 3.21. Is the law then against the promises of God? If a sinner can't be saved by the law, then does that make the law contrary to the gospel? God forbid. No, no. You see, the, the, the law is honored by the gospel. The law is not done away with by the gospel. The gospel doesn't frustrate uh, the law, any more than the law, frustrates the grace of God when used lawfully. The law is consistent with the gospel. It, the law just can't save you, except that Christ has kept the law for you. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given, which could have given life, and let's face it, if, if the law in the garden wasn't good enough to produce and preserve life in us, you can have everything you want except that. That's pretty easy law, you would think. 
but not for sinners. Because you see, the problem with a sinner is not they prefer that fruit over that fruit. The problem with a sinner is they want to be God. If it was just a matter of taste, we had plenty to eat. We had plenty to enjoy. Paradise. No, it's a matter of authority. It's a matter of who's going to be God. And as long as that one thing was withheld with us from us, we could not tolerate that. The potential for sin within us was suggested by Satan and we fell for it head over heels because of the sinful heart desiring to be God. You can eat whatever you want to eat. You shall be as God's. So if there could have been a law given, that probably would have been it. Maybe we could keep that. No, no which could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. If we could keep a law, then we would be righteous by that law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin. All under sin. And the gospel didn't come in spite of that. The gospel came because of that. That was true because of Christ. It wasn't plan B. God gave the law as a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. God's purpose all along was a bride for his son, not a bunch of little do-gooders. That the promise that, that so that, God did it that way on purpose. God wasn't thwarted in the garden or, or any time that you sin. It's according to his purpose. He's concluded us all under sin so that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. The promise by faith of not faith in, it does come by faith in him, through by grace through faith. But it's the faithfulness of Christ. It's, it's in Christ and his faithfulness to the law that all of God's promises are yea and amen. Might be given. There's your part in it. We just receive. We just receive what God did for us in his son. So you see what we're saying, that keeping the commandment, that's not something we're able to do in and of ourselves. So why does the Lord say to his disciples in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments? Why does he say that? Well, the key word there is love. If you love me, do what I tell you to do. Do what I say. If you love me, if you love him, he's already saved you. And you know how he saved you? By free grace through faith in Christ. Faith which works, by the way. Faith without works is dead. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1, please, verse 15. 1 Timothy 1:15. This is what the law means to the believer right here. 1 Timothy 1.5. I said 50, it's uh, 1 Timothy 1.5. Now the end of the commandment, that's our, that's our text. If you keep the commandment of God, the end, the purpose, the goal purpose of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned true 
unhypocritical, honest <laughs> faith in Christ. That's the goal of the law. You see that? Love. The goal of the law is not obedience. I want you to think about that for a minute. The goal of the law is not your obedience to God. Do you think God is naive about that? Do you think he gave his law so that you would keep it? <laughs> God's not that naive. No. He, the, the, the end, the goal, the purpose of the law is love. To love him. Love out of a pure heart. Well, how did our heart get pure? And of a good conscience, how did our conscience get pure? And of faith unfeigned, faith in Christ. You know what a good conscience is? It's not one that that somebody has that's, you know, their good is outweighed their bad. Have you ever heard anybody say, that? well, my good outweighs my bad at least, you know. That's not a good conscience. If you've ever sinned one time, you're a goner. A good conscience is one in... in which, which countenances no guilt whatsoever because it trusts in the Savior. A good conscience is one that's able to say, who shall lay anything to my charge? It is Christ that died. That's the only good conscience there is right there. If you're able to say that, nobody can charge me with any wrongdoing because my Savior died for my sins, according to the scriptures. That's a good conscience right there. And love. It, it, the, the, the end of the law is love, not obedience. Of course, we desire to obey God's law as believers. We're going we're to read that in a minute. But that's not the end of the law. The goal of, if the goal of the law is to get you to obey God, then the law is a failure. <laughs> no, the goal of the law is love. Paul said, I love the law of God after the end with man. You know why he loved the law of God? Because he loved God. And he wanted to please God. He wanted to honor God. Out of a pure heart. That's the only kind of heart that'll want that. And the only pure heart is the one washed in the blood of God's son. So you see how, you see how the law is not something that we ever we ever obey. <coughs> and you could put that qualification that we never obey the law perfectly. But if you haven't obeyed the law perfectly, you haven't obeyed the law. We don't have to put that qualification on it, do we? <laughs> I don't have to say I have never obeyed the law. Per I've never obeyed the law unless I've done it perfectly. my Savior did, my substitute did, my Redeemer did perfectly. That's the only way you can obey God is perfectly. If it ain't perfect, it's not obedience. It's not what he said. All right, so now the end of the law is not what people think it is. It's love, a good conscience, and faith unfeigned. The goal of the law is to cause you to look to Christ and believe on him desperately, urgently. I'm a goner under God's law unless Christ kept it for me. And so I look to him. I believe on him. I trust him for that. Unless Christ has washed me from all of my guilt before God's law. that I'm a goner from which some have swerved aside have swerved have have which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling what's this vain jangling they're just rambling they're just saying stupid stuff what do you mean paul well they desire to be teachers of the law but they don't know anything about the law they think the law is, the purpose of the law is for you to do good so you can go to heaven when you die that's vain jangling. That's foolishness. That's blasphemy is what that is. That's trampling under your nasty, sinful, wretched black feet 
the blood of God's son. That's what that is. Nor where have they affirmed. But we know that the law is good. It's not that the law is bad. The law is good if a man use it lawfully. They're not using the law lawfully when they say the law is, is a means to gain favor with God, to gain acceptance with God. That's not using it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man. <coughs> the law is made for sinners. It's not made for righteous people, that's saying, and it's also saying this, it's not made to make righteous people, to make people righteous. It's not for that but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners. That's what the law is for. And so if the law, contrary, far from doing anything about that, it actually reveals that in us, the ungodliness and the lawlessness, and the, then where's our hope? Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers. Why do you think the law says those things? Why is there a law that says thou shalt not kill? Because we're murderers, that's why. If nobody ever murdered anybody, what would be the need to have a law that says thou shalt not kill? For them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. And all of that is, a, isn't this brilliant and wonderful? According to, to the glorious gospel of the blessed God. It's the gospel that tells us, don't look to Sinai. Don't look to the commandment for salvation. The commandment is pointing you to Christ for salvation. That's using the law lawfully is to see it as the schoolmaster that it is. To cause you to flee to God's son for righteousness. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. That, boy, that doesn't sound like the gospel much, does it, to call you a whoremonger and a liar and a murderer and a kidnapper and all kind everything. No, it is. You need to know that about yourself. And you need to know that the only hope for a wretch like you is God's darling son, the savior of sinners. A sinner's righteousness, if he has any, is Christ and him alone. Romans 10, 1. Let's turn over there too. And I, I, well, we got to look at this Romans 10, 1, if we're going to talk about righteousness and keeping the commandment and how that, that, that's life, according to our text. We've got to keep the commandment to have life. But we see the impossibility of that in and of ourselves. Romans 10, 1, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. My goodness, why do they need to be saved? They're zealous for God. That's what they need to be saved from, their zeal. Because it's not according to knowledge. Their zeal is to keep the law to be outwardly as righteous as they can so that they'll be accepted of God. That's not according to knowledge. That's not according to the truth of the gospel. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness have not submitted themselves. Oh, wait a minute. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. That's what everybody's going to do that's ignorant of God's righteousness. 
If you haven't seen that Christ is the righteousness of God, you know what you'll do? You'll try to please God yourself. You'll try to do good things so that God will say, I'm happy with him. I'll take him to heaven. People say things like, well, if anybody's going to heaven, my old mama will. She, she was such a sweet person. A lot of sweet persons in hell. The blood of Christ is the only thing that washes sin away. And everything we do is sin. Old mama's sweetness was sin. That's what we need to understand. And we loved her for it. We loved her. I'm glad I had a sweet mama. But that's not going to stand up before God now. That's not going to measure up. She's going to have to have Christ. And me too. Going about to establish their own righteousness. Have not submitted. It's a bowing, isn't it? It's a submission. Because it's a confession that everything I do is evil. My good can't outweigh my bad because I don't have any good. My righteousness is there as filthy rags in the sight of God. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Where is that found? For Christ is the goal of the law. Christ is the termination of the law for righteousness. You will never look to the law for righteousness again once you see the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for you. Never again. To everyone that believeth, for Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. The only way to be righteous according to the law is to do it perfectly in thought, word, and deed. That's why when the Israelites had that attitude, that, that understanding of the, that misunderstanding of the law, that they were going to do it in order to live, Paul said, I, I pray to God that he would save them from that. He would save them. But the righteousness which is of faith, the only righteousness there is for a sinner is by faith in Christ because he is our righteousness. The righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is not, it's even in thy mouth. God will put it in your heart his law, he'll write it in your heart. And when he does, you'll know that you'll never measure up to it. And you'll look to Christ for righteousness. And you'll say so. It's in your mouth. And, and shall, uh, look at verse 9. Uh, which is what we preach, verse 8. Even in thy mouth and in thy heart that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. You see, confessing the Lord Jesus is talking about in this context concerning the righteousness of the law. When you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you're confessing that the only way I'm going to be righteous in the sight of God is by the Lord Jesus and his righteousness. And shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead you'll be saved that way by Christ and what he did. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. So how do you keep the law? How do you keep the commandment according to our text? With your heart, you believe on Christ. unto righteousness <laughs> and you're going to say so aren't you with your mouth confession is made unto salvation if Christ is all of your righteousness and all of your works are filthy rags you're going to let everybody know that <laughs> there ain't going to be any doubt in anybody's mind that ever hears 
never knows you. That you lean not on the arm of the flesh. That you have no confidence in your flesh. But you rejoice in Christ Jesus. So what's our text saying? Who is he that keepeth the commandment? Well, again, just because the law can't save us doesn't make it bad. In fact, those who believe on Christ for righteousness strive to honor God's law. Isn't that what Paul said? I know that in me, he said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. As a believer, no good thing. For to will is present with me, though. I want to. I want to honor him. But how to perform that which is good, I find not for the good that I would do. I would do. I would do. I would worship him this morning with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength and love him like that. But how to perform that, I find not. And the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not. I don't want to dishonor the Lord. Do you? But that I do. That I do. In this flesh, that I do. When God saves a sinner, that sinner will strive to obey and honor the Lord out of love for him who first loved us. But as Paul lamented over, we cannot keep the law as we would or as is required of the holy God. So the second point here is vital. Two things. That first, the law is not bad. We desire to keep the law, but there's only one way a sinner can keep the law. John 6, 26. Listen to this carefully in closing. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of God, the Son of Man, shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So he's saying, don't, don't strive and work and for, for bread and fish, for meat that, that perisheth, for earthly physical food, but, but spiritual, eternal food. Work for that, labor in that effort, in that, uh, on that basis to, 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 to be fed with the bread of life and, and to drink the water of life, labor for that. So he's talking about working. And so their question comes this way. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? How do we labor for this eternal bread that you're speaking of? How do we accomplish that? What all do we have to do? Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God. This is what you have to do that you believe on him of whom he had seen. That you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you please God. That's how you are acceptable with God. That's how you measure up. And faith is not a work. He's not saying there that 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 Quit doing that work and do this work. He's saying the the way that you please God is not a work. It's faith. It's the gift of faith from God. Faith that he gives. What a blessed paradox that most will never understand. Those who strive to keep the commandment for righteousness will never obtain righteousness. But those who obtain righteousness are those who rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. To despise God's ways, our text says, which most sinners absolutely do, is to hate grace. Is to hate God's way of salvation, which is his son. To hate God's way by grace through faith in Christ, and the end result of that, as our text says, is eternal death. In Christ Jesus, 
I have kept the commandment of God. According to our text, I have. And God says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Not because of anything I have ever done or ever will do, but because by his grace I stand before him in my substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray.